then he says that to deal with the ecological question, people are going to have to give up this view that they're independent units. We're going to have to view ourselves as part of the whole. I don't, you know, I'm not with him on ecology. If we view ourselves not as separate from the whole, which is the earth, but as a part of the whole, then we're going to realize that uh, we are just a part of what's happening. And it's not necessarily evil that we exist. We exist because here's the earth, dinosaurs existed, we exist. There's nothing wrong with that. And I think if we view ourselves as part of the whole, so see there, so I get to go in the separate direction from David Bohm. He says if we see ourselves as part of the whole, then we'll take care of our environment. I say if we see ourselves as part of the whole, we'll quit being so upset about hurting the environment. Right? How does it hurt an environment to build a road through it? Because, oh, because the tortoises come up on the road to warm in the sun and get run over. Oh, boo frickin' who? And uh, we're going to have to start viewing ourselves as part of that whole rather than as some little independent entity. Uh, humans that have evolved, came from God's finger or whatever, and then there's the earth here, which we're abusing. No, we have evolved on the earth, we're part of the earth, and it's our business what goes on the planet. Now back to the individual in society, the individual being a little packet of information. If Bohm's theory is correct, then each individual, like every electron, contains all of the information of the whole system. Now, that's not really true in society. It might have been true thousands of years ago or whatever. Today it is kind of true, though, because if you go to anybody in the United States of America, you're going to have a basic background knowledge of knowing about a little bit of electricity. You turn lights on like this. They're going to know something about fire. They're going to know something probably about English, about speaking, maybe something about math, numbers, how to count. Uh, then they're probably going to know something about how to go to the supermarket, the exchange of money for goods. They're going to know something about the roadways, maybe, maybe even about TV and turning TV and radio on for information. So there's a background basis of information that every single unit has. Um, in society, we'll find exceptions to that, retards or whatever. But in reality, we're not going to find that. Uh, every electron's going to have the whole story. Now he talks for a minute about the sustainability of the planet. He says if everyone were trying to live at the European, Japanese, and American standard of living, it would be like a swarm of locusts uh, descending on the planet. And um, I just take exception to that. I simply do. Julian Simon is an important economist you might want to go to if you want to know more about the sustainability of large populations. Now he says at 7 minutes and 15 seconds, uh, he's talking about whether or not society is going to accept the new correct view of, or are they going to keep going on the old view or whatever. And he says, now, we can't keep going. What, he says, what if our economy keeps growing at the uh, present rate, you know? Um, and he giggles. He's like, where are we going to be? And he thinks it's impossible. Um, and that's what Malthus would have said. Thomas Malthus. Is it Thomas Malthus? I don't even know his name. Isn't that a shame? Uh, Malthus said that um, productivity grows 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. And population grows... 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, uh, 32, 64. So, according to Malthus, they were up against a wall in the late 1700s. Or was it the early 1800s, or was it the mid-1700s? I don't know when he wrote it. And he said, we are, we've reached a point, we're at a tipping point. We've got too many people, we can't produce enough for them. Uh, they are using all the land that's any good, we can't bring more land into use. If we do bring more land into use, it'll be too late because we've got way, 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 way too many people. Um, so imagine Malthus, about 200 years ago, saying, he would giggle. He would say, imagine if this economic growth continues. Imagine if our population continues. He might have said something like this. He might have said, he's, he might have said, it, you know, by the year 2000, we might have upwards of a billion people on this planet. There's no way it would work. We would all starve to death. You know, and here we have six billion and growing, six and a half billion. People are starting to say seven billion. It's a little too early. Give it a few years, we could say seven billion. Uh, over six billion people on the planet right now. And uh, I think that uh, David Bohm is wrong. We can continue growing on this. And Malthus was wrong. So I'm glad that this is just about the only thing I disagree with Bohm on. Uh, he has a very, 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 very good uh, view of physics. And uh, I was hinted towards this by David Harriman's uh, course. You can get that at Ayn Rand Institute.
called The Crisis in Physics and Its Cause. And he talks about Bohm and how we ought to look into Bohm. In a question, a person question, uh, the questioner asked, and he replied, Look into David Bohm's theory where the electron's embedded in a wave function. And that uh, does away with the contradictions. And uh, I had never looked into it again. I should have looked on YouTube. I, this is, there's not much available by him, but this uh, interview that I've just done a very good treatment of, or at least a long treatment, uh, is, is a good, good bit, bit of, a, of a view into what he's doing, what he's saying that's different from the normal view. Especially if you're quite uh, caught up in the normal view or informed in the normal view. I've read so many uh, books uh, or documentaries, watched so many documentaries about quantum mechanics and uh, cosmology and re relativity and Einstein that uh, I have a very easy context for this stuff. It's a little difficult to get into, which is why I did this whole video. Um, Nine Nine said she watched it through a couple more times and still couldn't get what was important or whatever. Now, I rest my case on all the things I've just been saying about it. Uh, and But we have about two or three more minutes of the video to go through, so let's do that. Now the interviewer says, do you think that uh, it's easy or difficult or what for the people to understand and uh, what you're saying? Uh, the people at the, at the scientific institutes, the ones who are steeped in these theories, the scientists, is it difficult or whatever for them to, are they going to be able to understand your theory or, or your, your new situation, what you're saying? And uh, David Bohm says, well, I think that normal people, regular people on the street instead of scientists in the, in the universities, he says, I think that normal people get what I'm saying um, m quicker and easier, and it's able to be communicated to people without much knowledge about the system easier because the scientists are clinging to the old atomistic view of the world, that every single little part is we can only say this is what it is. We can't say anything about its connection to the rest of it because how could we ever know that? So he says normal people get what I'm saying more than the scientists do. If that doesn't put you on his side, not a lot will. And the interviewer says, so you're saying that science is showing us something scientists today won't, don't want to see. Niels Bo or pardon me, uh, David Bohm says, well, they're uncomfortable about changing it. They are just so used to looking at it in the way they're looking at it that uh, they, they don't feel comfortable going over to a new view. Uh, it's glad that we have philosoph it's good that we have philosophers around to be able to sort out brilliant people like this and sort of put them in order and say, yeah, he said things that were correct in physics, but he was groping like a goddamn blind man as far as uh, you know epistemology or whatever philosophy whatever went. These scientists don't they don't feel uncomfortable wanting to change their worldview. They have accepted on faith, without any proof at all, they have accepted on faith the Kantian tenet that you cannot know reality itself. You can only know what we see. They've accepted that. So it's not that they feel uncomfortable. It's that they've accepted Immanuel Kant. Uh, so it's, we're not going to you know, get them a nice chair, little uh, ice for their head to help them through the situation, a bit of a drink of some juice or something so they don't get thirsty, make them comfortable. No, it's not that they're uncomfortable. It is that they have the wrong philosophical view. So that is the end of the videos uh, on David Bohm. I am exhausted on this. I'm not a physicist. I don't like physics especially because I don't like math especially, even though I know, no, I, I know m more math now than ever before. But I don't care for math too much, and physics, therefore, is out. So I am not going to get further into David Bohm. Those of you who are into physics... I hope might do something in that realm and uh, please contribute something to my bottom line if you appreciate the time I put into this.